nice sound system. Welcome everyone to the Westport Public Library here in splendid, wonderful Westport, Connecticut. We're gathered together tonight at the invitation of the Westport Library to share with you a concept that we feel is important and with an artist that we feel is important. Uh, the concept involves bringing people together through music, where they can sit and discuss certain kinds of music and toss ideas around and then be entertained by live performance of that kind of music. It's called Speaking of Music. And we feel it's an honor and a privilege to be here with this wonderful team of people led by Bill Harmer and all of his team that are doing the most fantastic things for the town of Westport and the community at large. They are looked at by the library world as the pioneer and the grand dame of the art. And what better place to have a fabulous library than in a fabulous town like Westport? We're lucky people. My childhood was in Weston and Westport, as was the childhoods of not only Michael Friedman, but also our other guest tonight, Michael Lapatino, who will be on the discussion with us tonight with Mr. Friedman. And we're very excited about the opportunity to be here with you because we have a story of Michael's tonight that is totally unique, all his own, never to be repeated, ever because he was there in the naked underwear of the rock and roll world in the late 60s with a camera so good that it'll blow your mind when you walk around and see this fabulous artwork all around the room. And better than that, he has stories that connect his journey through the music business in the late 60s of how he had unlimited access because of his connection with his boss, Mr. Albert Grossman, to handle the artists under Grossman's control, which included at the time Bob Dylan, the band, Janis Joplin, Rita and Chris Christopherson, Rita Coolidge, Todd Rundgren. And we'll talk more about that when the artist comes out. Um, but I wanted to thank everyone, and in particular, I would like to thank the energy and enthusiasm and talent of Donna Vita in her efforts to bring together the book and the concept, and without which we wouldn't be here tonight. So thank you very much, Donna. If you haven't met Donna, you should hang around and try and meet her. She's as nice as she is beautiful and talented as well. It's a hard trio to beat. So I'm delighted to be here and happy to know that people are coming out, talking to each other and listening to each other and sharing that wonderful universal language we call music. It's the same eight notes we've been playing for 50 years. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, there's no H, no I. So it's just circling around a different way. So we're going to attempt tonight, um, after you are charmed and entertained by the discussion, we're going to have a fabulous musical ensemble called the Old School Review, which has been kicking around here for 20 years. And we celebrate all kinds of old music. My kids will kick the crap out of me when I say something like that, but we believe that the b best music possible was probably in the rearview mirror, but there's a lot of good things happening as well. <laughs> Everybody, you know, like my father used to say, some like chocolate, some like vanilla. <laughs> I never warmed up to rap or opera. <laughs> but give me a good soul band and man, I'm a happy camper. So I think we're ready to bring the team up here I uh, appreciate the opportunity and uh, welcome you all here this evening. Enjoy the facilities of the library 
and all that it does. It's an amazing place. You can't believe the enormity of programming and activities that are going on here. Yeah, I'll follow you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is Michael Friedman sitting in the middle. And Mr. Michael Lapatino from PLR. Yes, I think. PLR FM Radio in New Haven. 36 years. 37. Fantastic piece of plastic. No, I got my start right here on Main Street in Westport above uh, Oscar's Delicatessen. It was WMMM, WDJF. And I was, yeah, back it was 1976. So I really have never worked a day in my life. I mean, this is work right now. <laughs> uh, but it's great to be here. And of course, representing the class of 72, Staples High School, Mr. Michael here, 61. 61. And I think Roger was 19, uh, what was it, 46? 56? No, it was 66. But, you know, living in this town, and I was in Weston and Westport, and my first concert that I got to see at Staples High School was 1968 with Cream. Uh, and, and if you're familiar with Staples High School, I, I would assume everybody is, uh, the roster of music they had there between 66 and 68 was just, just mind-blowing. And, and, and again, it's all relative to, the, to this man's book right here. It's just all of those stories. And it's not about the, the stars as much as it is the people behind the scenes, the Albert Grossmans, the Roy Silvers, you know, the uh, Bob New, Newworths. These guys really were the, were the focal uh, true. Uh, you know, yeah. I mean, the other stars are great. We all know Janice and everybody else, and that's great. But the stuff that was going on behind there, which is which is in your book, uh, you just can't put it down. You, you really can't. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Before we begin, I just want to make mention of the importance of the Westport factor here, because we're all Westporters uh, in our youth, and we lived in the 60s here. In fact, in 1969, I was a waiter at the Westport Playhouse, and uh, we had a singing group called Four on the Floor. We were doing four-part a cappella versions of doo-wop songs while we waited on tables there, which was a hell of a lot of fun. And uh, we had an eager and talented busboy named Michael Lapatino <laughs> to help us. It's where I met and that's. Mind. About the last time I have seen Michael, except for <laughs> maybe 20 years. <laughs> we still look the same. It was 1970. Yeah, it was good pot then, Not too. Not really. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Better now. <laughs> Legal, too. Yeah. I think we're, we're getting off the... Yeah, I knew this was going to happen. We're getting so, off the topic here. Uh, it's important that uh, just we mention the charm and appeal of the environment here, because... It spawned characters like Michael or myself, who as young children and adults and young adults, we were caught with the music bug and uh, it never went away. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had the good fortune, like others, some others, that music was part of my life as a child. I had music from my grandfather and my mother and father. And uh, it just overwhelmed me and took my life by storm. So uh, with that, Westport history, um, only a town like Westport with the arts history and theater history and design history and uh, cultural environment that this town has always been known for, could I support a fabulous library like this one. So I think you should give yourselves a round of applause because without your support, <laughs> it wouldn't be possible to build this. And with that, I will pass the mic to Michael, who grew up here as well, and uh, he'll start off and tell you where it all came from. Well, I don't know about growing up, but, uh, <coughs> uh, but um, first of all, I'd just like to say that uh, Donna and I are, are just honored to have our book be launched here at the library, and uh, we want to thank Bill Harmer and his incredible staff um, this library is unlike any in the country, I believe, 
and is probably the model for all others that wish to, you know, achieve what they've done here. So, so thank you, Bill, and thank you to all of the people that have, that have helped put this together. Um, my, my journey kind of... Uh, yeah. Bill. Um, my journey started uh, in somewhere in the mid-50s. Uh, when I was 12 years old, I went to a family party, and uh, for some reason I was just enthralled with the drummer. I have no idea why. I just stood there the whole night and watched this guy play the drums. And uh, at the end of the evening, when he was packing up, he called me over, and he was aware of the fact that I had been watching him uh, for the whole night. And he, he said to me, um, I think you need these. And he handed me a pair of sticks. And uh, that was the beginning. That was the first time that I ever really was aware of uh, that I had some kind of an interest in number one, you know, playing the drums or, or whatever. But that was kind of the, the trigger that I remember so far back. And that it, it's so many years that it's amazing that I still remember that. So that was the beginning. And then the next thing that happened, I mean, Westport for me was, uh, I'm a real hometown boy. This is my turf. And I was, uh, along with Barry Tashin, who went on to be a famous uh, rock band called The Remains. Uh, he and I started a band in Westport called The Schemers. And uh, we were the first rock and roll band in, in uh, Westport. And uh, we used to play uh, Saturday nights in the canteen at the, uh, at the lunch room at Staples. And it, actually, it was the beginning of the Staples uh, on North Avenue. We were the first class that went through that the school that's there now. In any case, um, there were a lot of connections <clears throat> that were made for me in the, um, in the late 50s and early 60s. Um, and it was, rock and roll was really just a baby. I mean, it, it had just really been, you know, it was very controversial. Older people hated it. And we, uh, a generation of kids my age just became entranced by it and, and just loved it. Um, the, uh, I have some memories of, of what a um, this period of discovery it was because it, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have anything um, like we have today. So you would, you would discover acts and, and talent and records that uh, that would just open doors for you. I remember one time, my lifetime friend Chris Burdett, who I see sitting right over here, who's been my friend for almost 70 years. I'm embarrassed to say, <laughs> it, it, it dates me. Um, I remember him coming over to my house and and telling me about this album that he had bought. And he brought this album over, and it was a guy named Ray Charles. And, uh, and so it was kind of, that's what it was like all the time. I mean, you would have uh, Little Richard and Fats Domino and, and uh, Elvis Presley and all the, all the 50s artists who would set the stage for this revolution that was about to take place in the 60s which probably a lot of the people in this room are aware of, you know, with the English invasion and the Beatles and so forth. But in those days, in the late 50s and early 60s, that was where my career started as uh, playing in drums. You can't really call it a career because I was just playing drums in a high school band. But um, it stuck with me, and that was kind of where it all started. And that was a real pivotal time, uh, 59, 60, 61, when, you know, the folk music scene started to, to make it big in New York, and where your career, actually your career started out in L.A., but you came back to New York. Uh, but that was such an incredible time, uh, you know, of, uh, I remember my parents uh, would listen to, you know, uh, the Kingston Trio and Bob Dylan, uh, you know, Peter, Paul, and Mary, and then that started to become a whole thing. But I think the music also has a reflection of what was going on 
uh, in the times then. Absolutely. And, yeah. uh, and it was a real good reflection. The 50s were fun, you know, a fun time. And as we started getting into the 60s, you know, uh, things were a lot different. People, younger people were much more aware. It's actually where I feel the, the generation gap actually began. Uh -huh. You know, before that, my father uh, and his parents, uh, they enjoyed all the same music, the big band era, whatever. Uh, as we entered into the 60s, there was this generation gap of, you know, between me and, and my parents. I, I was listening to Jimi Hendrix, and, you know, they were listening to, you know, Tony Bennett and Frank Sinatra. Right. Uh, so at that time, it was, uh, that had a lot to do with it. Well, the 60s was really an explosion of creativity. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it was the, Donna always says to me, was everybody in the music business born in 1943? Um, because, it, Almost. Um, it's amazing that the uh, that that year sort of spawned uh, the the whole generation of singer songwriters from James Taylor to Paul McCartney. I mean, Crosby, Stills and Nash. All of those guys. We were all the same age, and we all uh, were affected by the uh, um, by the music scene. And and a lot of us felt like we had a had to be part of it, and that was my story. By the way, uh, that's you on the drums up there on the right, and, and Barry Tashin on the left. That's right, that's that's the schemers. The schemers. Fabulous schemers. First rock band at Westport. Yeah, and that's in the cafeteria at Staples. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think I recognize that wall. Yeah. There, was, uh, there was another guy in, uh, at Staples named Mike Borchetta, <clears throat> and Mike went on to have a big career uh, as, in the in the music business in California, and he started bringing bands to Westport when we were still uh, in in school, and uh, and one time uh, he brought this band in that was a, a kind of a big a big deal. It was Harvey and the Moonglows, and the Moonglows had like three. Um, hits at the time, and uh, I was 15 at the time. I uh, he called sincerely, yeah, sincerely, yeah, over and over, yeah. And anyway, he called me up and he said, um, the drummer from the Moonglows is passed out. He's drunk, and he's on the stairs to the stage, and we can't wake him up. And so, you know, would you be able to play the gig? And I, you're 15. I, I was 15, right. yeah, and white. And, uh, <laughs> so not a great recommendation for a drum, <laughs> sitting in on the drums. Uh, uh, and self-taught and left-handed. So add all that up. And so I, I was thrilled, you know, because I knew their records. And I was like, it was like oh, my God, I, absolutely, you know. And don't wake them up. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah. Famous rock photographer of oh. his day. Okay. So anyway, my mother had to drive me to the gig because I didn't have a driver's license yet. And uh, I was a, a late bloomer, so I think I was about five foot nothing. And uh, my drums were bigger than me. And uh, I remember bringing my drums in there, and this guy was passed out on the floor. And I was stepping over him, carrying my bass drum, and hoping that I wouldn't kick him so I wake him up and lose my big chance. Anyway, that was at the YMCA, which was, used to be right across the street here. And, um, and so I played the gig, and, uh, and, and the, at the end of the gig, the guys came over and they gave me this uh, photograph. Uh, it signed it to me, and, uh, and Harvey said to me, Mike, you count to four good for a white boy. <laughs> So that was the greatest compliment I ever got as a drummer. And, uh, and so that was, that was the first professional gig that I ever uh, really had, and almost the last. <laughs> anyway, I, I, dig I digress. Am I still talking? Oh. Oh, well, there it is. And By the way, speaking of, of rock right photographers, uh, that picture was taken at the Kriegsman studio and the signature uh, f photograph for any rock act when they were happening would be the, have the Kriegsman picture. Uh -huh. And there's the signature on the There box. it is, yeah. I didn't even have a camera then. 
But did you set out? You didn't really set out to be a photographer. I mean, you, you like taking pictures, you, and you did like photography, but right. you, you were, it was the music bug that got you. Right. Well, there was another guy in Staples um, by the name of Bruce Lawrence, and he was in our class. And Bruce went on to become a professional fashion photographer in New York City. And he was very successful. He had a studio on the west side, and, uh, and I was living in Manhattan at the time. And I was working with, I was managing the, the NAS with Todd Rundgren um, and doing publicity with a guy named John Curland. And um, I used to go and hang out in his studio and he gave me kind of free reign to the dark room and taught me, mentor, really mentored me in the art of black and white candid photography. And that's where all of the, my photography um, skills, if there are, if you could call it that, that's where I learned how to, how to take pictures. And uh, Bruce was a was a great teacher. And uh, and when I got started getting really interested and fell in love with photography, I started taking my camera with me, you know, on gigs and recording sessions and so forth, and not with any reason in mind uh, to use them professionally, but just because I wanted to record the music that I was hearing, you know, you record it on record and you take pictures of it and it's kind of the two of them connect in a way that gives you not only the memory of it, but the, you know, that's what records do and as well. your perspective, you were in a position where other photographers were not, you know, I look at, and again, right. in the book, it's really hard to put it down because there's so many great photographs, but they're not your, your uh, posed photographs of, these are like candid shots, this is like behind the scenes right. stuff. Well, I wasn't there as a photographer, so these were my friends, yeah. you know, uh, people that I worked with even later, like Janice and, and the band and so forth. They, uh, we were all the same age. We were all just kids doing what we were doing, and I would have my camera, and nobody was paying much attention to it. Um, and uh, it, so it really gave me a, an access point uh, where professional photographers didn't have that. You know, we used to keep the professional photographers out of the dressing rooms and um, far, far enough away from the stage, they would always be down in the pit, so you, most of their pictures would be like shooting up somebody's nose. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, for me, it was kind of, I was just hanging out, uh, you know, doing what we were doing, and so I had, I had good access. Before we get into um, you working with Albert Grossman, uh, which I find fascinating in the book, at that time, record companies, record labels, consist of maybe four people, <laughs> you know, five people. That was the company, that was it. Uh, yeah, it was amazing, yeah, actually. And, it's, uh, yeah. and I'm looking at the picture behind you, with you with, uh, I believe that's Barry and, is it Robin Gibb or Morris? Yeah, I'm it's sure. um, Barry Gibb and, and, Robin and Robin on the Gibb. left. And that was when I was in publicity. I, that was my first job in the, biz, in the music business. I was working with a guy named John Curland, and we were doing publicity for the Bee Gees and the Mamas and Papas and the Hollies and Glenn Campbell and a number of other... Uh, people, and it was it was a great job, and I learned a, a little bit about how to write and, and a little bit about how to photograph. I don't, I don't want to go back and forth, cr crisscross, but uh, I know you went to school out in Arizona, and then from there you started working in the music industry out in L.A. Uh, the, the difference in the L.A. music scene then, of course, Capitol Records were around for a while, and they were putting out all these you know great pop songs and everything else, but. Uh, you came back to New York, and New York at that time was definitely the, the mecca for, for, for music, uh, folk music especially. Like, yeah. you talk about uh, mamas and the papas, everybody thinks California Dream, they're California band. They came to New York before, to get signed and, yeah. and, to, and to audition. So yeah. that was a real happening time to be, to be there. Well, when I first went to L.A., I wasn't in the music business. I was, <clears throat> I was hired out of college by J. Walter Thompson and uh, because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And they were the only company that I interviewed with, and they liked me, and they flew me out to California, and I had an interview with the president of the uh, office there, <clears throat> and um, he hired me and, uh, and offered me a job on the spot. And so, you know, I mean, the money was good. It was $6,500 a year. I mean, <laughs> who could beat that? And, uh, you know, so... Uh, at some point, he called me in and he said, you know, Mike, I'm... Uh, and by the way, while I was working out in L.A. training, I was also managing and producing a, 
uh, band out there, a garage band named California Sons. I, I think, I don't know if we have that up there. You're but right, right behind you, you got your yeah. three signals, singles right there. Those, and, and again, Mike Borchetta from Westport was out in California, and he and I were doing this on the side while I was uh, working as a, a trainee in the, uh, in, in the advertising business. So, um, you know, we, we'd make these records, and then we made our own label, Coastline Records. And, uh, and we were, you know, this, this particular record was a knockoff on the Bee Gees, uh, on the um, Beach Boys. And uh, Donna and I just found this clip on the internet the other day. We couldn't <laughs> believe it. <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty funny. Maybe, can we play that? Do you have that clip? <laughs> Where are the go-go girls? So you're supposed to be here at six o'clock. Okay, cut. <laughs> so, <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff, right? It was a happier time then. What, what is so amazing is that this thing is still out there somewhere. I never heard it or saw it. No one ever bought this record. No one ever heard this record. I don't know where it came from. The only reason it's up here is because we found it in a bunch of stuff, looking, you know, re <laughs> researching the book. Um, anyway, to make a long story, not as long as it's supposed to be, but um, the guy, um, the head of the office came to me and he said, uh, I'm taking a six-month sabbatical from J. Walter Thompson to manage Richard Nixon's campaign for president. And uh, I'd like you to join us, and you could take a sabbatical, and uh, you'd be the advance man. You go to the next town, and you set up the speech, and then we follow you and come in, and you go to the, you know, in front of us. And uh, he says, if we, if we lose, we come back to J. Walter Thompson. Nothing's nothing's lost and if we win there'll be a job for you in the white house so i said to him well you know uh, bob i said i i don't think i could work with richard nixon um i'm a i'm a east coast boy democrat and uh, i'm going to respectfully decline the offer but thank you so much anyway I said, I want to go back to New York and, you know, be in the office there. So he said, okay, we'll send you back to New York. And uh, he went on to become uh, chief of staff for Richard Nixon. His name was H.R. Haldeman. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and the guy who took my job that I could have had uh, was a guy named Dwight Chapin, another JWT junior executive, and he became Nixon's appointment secretary and special assistant. And both he and Haldeman ended up doing, I think, two years in Lompoc prison <laughs> for Watergate crimes. It could have been you. <laughs> if I were a Republican, it might have been. Anyway, where am I? Go back to New York. Go back. <laughs> So, when you, so, so after L.A., you came back to, how did you hook up with Albert Grossman? Albert Grossman, if, if you don't know, you can tell, the manager of, uh, uh, of uh, Bob Dylan and uh, Janis Joplin. Right. Uh, and it's also a very, very uh, funny story uh, with uh, Albert Grossman and another fellow named Roy Silver, who, uh, yeah. no, re no relation to Steve Silver, who's out there in the audience. Steve, hi. <laughs> Where are you? Okay. Uh, long time no see. I see a lot of friendly faces out oh. there. Um, but, but there's a great, a great yeah, story. It's, it's an interesting short story. Um, Albert uh, came to New York from Chicago, and he had a club in Chicago called the Gate of Horn. And uh, it had a lot of blues players, a lot of folk player, uh, singers and players. Um, I think he started managing there. He had Odetta and then brought her to New York, and he had Bob Gibson and some other... Joan Baez, I think, for a while in the very beginning. And um, he decided to come to New York and set up a management uh, firm. He knew a guy named Roy Silver who, was, who had a little office in New York, and he was struggling, but he was somewhat successful. Anyway, Albert came to New York, and he got together with uh, Roy Silver. 
and Silver at the time, Albert didn't really have many artists. I think he might have had Odetta and nobody else when he came to New York. But um, Silver had two artists that he was managing. Uh, one was a comedian and the other was a folk singer. And um, he was short on cash, he needed money. And so he s told Albert, and Albert had some money because he had sold the Gate of Horn Club. He said to Albert, um, I'm willing to sell either of the artists that I have, um, but the folk singer is doing a little better than the comedian, so if we, I need ten thousand dollars, and um, let's and if if uh, let's flip a coin, and whoever wins the flip can take their pick. But if you pick the folk singer, you, it's an extra five hundred dollars has to pay the other guy because he's doing, he's doing better. So Albert agreed, they flipped the coin, and Albert won, of course. Um, he always did, somehow. Um, and it turned out that the comedian was Bob Cosby, and the folk singer was Bob Dylan. So he paid Silver 500 bucks, plus the 10,000, he ended up with Bob Dylan, <clears throat> put together Peter, Paul, and Mary, gave them blowing in the wind, and the rest is history. <laughs> made, made a good choice there. <laughs> uh, a picture of Alma Grossman there, and I looked in the book, uh, the, the picture of this young lady is unknown. <laughs> That's what it says. She's known for her legs, but otherwise... I guess, I I guess so. <laughs> Uh, but now, it was a, uh, his, his sister was uh, a part of the company. Is that right, or was that his wife? Uh, no, that was not his wife. Um, oh, okay. No, that definitely was not his no, wife. Go, go, going through the book, she looked like a tough... Uh, uh, is it Myra? Oh, no, that Myra, it was his publicist. Okay, that's... I, yeah. I, I met... Um, I was working in the publicity business with uh, John Curland and with all those people. And then one day I came to work and they were carrying John out on a stretcher from uh, our office. Uh, he had died unexpectedly, I don't know how or why, but um, so he was a young guy, he was in his 40s. Um, and uh, we were managing the NAS and uh, the NAS was kind of breaking up at, the point, at that point. And so I got there, and he, he was gone, and that was kind of that was the end of, uh, of the company. So um, uh, because he was a publicist, he he had introduced me over time. I knew a friend of his uh, that was Albert Grossman's pub publicist and did all the publicity for for their artists, and uh, her name was Myra Friedman, uh, and. She called me up after John died and said that Albert was looking for someone to join him in New York in his office because he was spending more time up in Woodstock where he had a house. He also had a place in Gramercy Park, but he was starting to spend more time upstate. And would I be interested? <clears throat> I said, yeah, I think so. Because uh, Albert was the m biggest manager in the history of the music business. And I was 20 four at the time. Donna, how old was I? My, my brain. <laughs> I was 25 at the time. Um, so I went and met with him, and uh, we spent about a half hour uh, chatting, although chatting with Albert is a euphemism, because uh, Albert was a very mysterious, kind of uh, enigmatic character, and uh, I was totally shocked at the end of this short discussion when he offered me the job. So um, all of a sudden, just like that, I was, you know, had a front seat at the greatest show on earth. And I became his uh, executive assistant. And then I um, brought Todd with me. And he and I were partners on Todd, and uh, who he did not get at all or like. And uh, Todd didn't like him either, but he, Todd was very ambitious and was uh, and very patient. So he came along, and eventually we were able to get Todd established and get him signed to a record deal and as a producer. Yeah. When did you hook up with Janis Joplin? Was that at the around the same time? I thought the Nas was out like in late yeah. late uh, late sixties. Yeah, sixty. Uh, I joined Albert in sixty eight. Yeah. And Janis was. Um, at that point, his biggest artist, uh, I mean, Bob Dylan, 
who was his biggest artist at that time, but they were kind of just about at the point where they were uh, separating. They were if you could just pause for one moment and look behind you, this has got to be one of the greatest pictures in, in the book. Thank I you. mean, it, it, to me, I look at that picture and it just, it just it tells a huge story. And those who were fans of, you know, Janis Joplin, Big Brother, back in the, back in the day, I mean, right there, look at that. That's just an incredible photograph. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Um, yeah, Janice was, uh, Janice was probably the most active and most, pop most successful artist when I joined Albert, be outside of Bob. But Bob was, uh, like I said, was pretty much, um, you know, parting ways with Albert at that point. They had a disagreement, contractual disagreement, and that was kind of close to the end of it. Um, yeah. And then you also would, uh, you had a date with her too. It uh, took her to the Rolling Stones show to <laughs> yeah. 1969 Stones. Uh, yeah, Janice, um, she wanted to go to the Stones concert, which was the probably the greatest rock and roll concert of all time. 1969, 1969 Madison Square Garden. Yeah. I think there'll be a picture coming up there. And when I first noticed about that picture, we'll, we'll get to that, is uh, to look at the stage setup. It's not coming, it'll come up in a, in a moment. It's yeah. like, Back in the day, these, uh, everything was stripped down. You know, there, yeah. was, there weren't these big elaborate sets. That's just how I remember her, with a bottle of tequila like in one hand and a lemon in the other. <laughs> uh, you know, she, was, uh, she was wonderful. I, I really I loved working with her, and you never knew what to expect. She was, she was everything you think she was and a whole lot more. She was tough and sweet and gentle and smart and... To, There's a great chapter lonely, uh, and, in, in the book. Yeah. I don't have the book over there, but great chapter in that book. Uh, on, actually, there's a lot of great chapters in, in the book, but th that one particularly in Janis Joplin is, uh, is pretty incredible. Well, Jan I spent more time with Janis than I did with many of the other artists because um, she was so active at the time. Yeah. And, um, you know, my, actually, my only, uh, I only had a few uh, encounters with, with Dylan, but I did have a memorable one. And uh, so, some of you guys out there have probably heard the story, but it's worth repeating, I think. Um, I got a call when I first joined Albert. It was uh, in the winter of 69, and it was a cold, snowy morning. And he, he called me up, and he was in Woodstock, and he was stuck in the snow. He couldn't get out of his, his driveway, and he was supposed to meet Bob in uh, Manhattan. Um, on the corner of 62nd and 2nd Avenue to go to Otto Preminger's townhouse and screen a movie. This um, is a good story. <laughs> so this was a, this was a movie that was flown in. It was a rough cut and it was not finished, but um, they flew it in because they wanted to use Bob's music in the film. And Albert was supposed to go and then we were going to have lunch, uh, brunch after screening this movie. Um, so we, we, went, uh, we went up to Preminger's and we watched this, this almost unwatchable movie called uh, Tell Me You Love Me, Junie Moon with Liza Minnelli. Anybody ever see that one? Me either. Uh, <laughs> I think I saw it in the Fine Arts 3, which is right over there. Of course, it was right over there. Yeah. Anyway, it was, it was just awful. And uh, Preminger was sitting between Bob and I, and he was just loving every painful minute of this thing. And Bob was falling asleep, and, and I was struggling to stay awake myself. Finally got to the end of it, and we went downstairs to a floor underneath the uh, ground floor, which was like a garden room, and uh, to have brunch. And it was beautiful. It was like uh, half outside and half inside, but you were inside, so you were, the snow was coming down and it felt like you were outside and inside. But uh, anyway, we, uh, we sat down to have brunch and Albert had told me that Bob doesn't talk much, so I was gonna have to carry our end of the conversation. I had never met Bob Dylan or Otto Preminger. I was 25 years old and I didn't know what the hell I was doing. But I, so how, how am I gonna carry the conversation? So there's these long, horrible pauses and Preminger is this arrogant, large, gruff, German, 
figure and Bob is sitting there just staring off into space and not saying anything. So I finally, in order to break the silence, I said, I said, so uh, Otto, I saw you on the Carson show last night and you were saying how there's all this violence in the movies today and how terrible it is. I said, how do you square that with the guy throwing battery acid in the girl's face and blinding her? He goes, slams his fist on the table. He says, that is not violent. So Dylan, who hasn't said a word up to now, he leans over and he goes, hey, Otto, this is pretty violent. So, so <clears throat> anyway, thing, Preminger says, well, do you want your music in my film or not? Bob looks at him, pauses, he says, well, Otto, he says, you know, I really liked it and it's real good. He says, but I don't know. He says, I think I'd have to see it again. Preminger says, see it again, you just saw it. It's on its way to the airport. We held up production, bring it over here for you. It costs thousands of dollars a day. So Bob says, well, I, I know, Otto, but that's, that's how it is. I have to see it again, I really would. So Preminger goes, stop the plane. And, you know, sends this little guy running around trying to call Idlewild Airport and get, get the tape back. Um, so make a long story short, we had brunch and Bob said, and Preminger says, when do you want to see it? And he says, uh, well, I'd like to come by tonight uh, with my wife and uh, we could have dinner. So Preminger goes, oh, okay. Uh, what time do you want to have dinner? Seven o'clock and what would you like? He brings the chef out, Bob orders wine and, and the entrees and stuff. And, uh, <clears throat> and then Bob says to him, Oh, yeah, one more thing, Otto. He says, uh, you can't be here. <laughs> Preminger looks at him and he says, what do you mean I can't be here? I live here. This is my house. He says, I know, but he says, Preminger says, where do you think I should go? He says, I don't know, but it can't be here. So he finally agrees to this. We wrap up the, the, the meeting and we... We uh, walk outside, and uh, I said to Bob, I said, I, I don't know what just happened. I said, you and I were watching the same thing. I, that was horrible. It was unwatchable. It was the worst thing I've ever seen. He said, well, it's bad, you know. And uh, I said, are you really coming back here tonight? He said, yeah. I said, are you coming with Sarah? He said, yep. I said, you going to have dinner? Yep. I said, well, why are you doing this? He says to me, well, you know, Mike, that room we had breakfast in? He says, Sarah and I are redoing a townhouse in the village. <laughs> he said, I really want her to see that. It's so cool the way you feel like you're outside and you're inside. I said, are you going to watch the movie? He went... <laughs> so the next day, the, the, the few days later on Monday, I hear Albert on the phone with Preminger who called in a rage screaming at him because he got the film back and, and Dylan came with his wife, had dinner and never watched the movie. <laughs> And uh, I hear Albert say, he says, you picked the only music that Bob Dylan ever wrote that has no words, which was the theme from Nashville Skyline. Skyline. He says, you don't even know who the fuck Bob Dylan is. <laughs> I, I, that's, that's, that's a, hey, Bob Dylan, I, I, maybe a lot of people don't know about this, but an incredible sense of humor. I mean, this guy is very, very funny. He used to listen to a lot of his radio broadcasts. He, I don't oh, think yeah. he does it anymore, but he would do radio shows. And a very dry sense of humor. A very, very funny guy. Uh, yeah. So where are we? Well, there's Roger. a picture of Janice Joplin. <laughs> Feel free to jump in here. <laughs> we want to know about the band and if uh, oh, you're okay. still backing up. Dylan. I was just going to say, that's sort of an unusual picture to see Janice with an acoustic guitar. I, I've never seen that before. Yeah, that was at yeah. Madison Square Garden. And it was... Uh, she, was, she only played me and Bobby McGee twice in concert, once yeah. this time and once in Nashville. <clears throat> and, um, and so that was, that was at Madison Square Garden in 69. That was her biggest concert ever. Is that with uh, Paul Butterfield and, and Johnny Winter? If Johnny I'm not Winter yeah. showed up and, yeah. and played, and Paul Butterfield played. Um, yeah, it was a great night, and uh, she... Just incredible. Yeah, that Donna put that collage together. Those were photographs from that concert, and they were—it's actually sequential. 
Um, and uh, and I, just, I just love this. We, you know, we're going we're gonna to make a print uh, of it. Um, but she was, uh, she loved the pictures for some reason that I took of her. And so we ended up doing a, a songbook from, the, from this series of photographs. Um, oh, there it is. Um, the one on the left was what Janice and I did in my office one afternoon, just cobbled together a cover of a, for a songbook, and Donna and I came across it uh, when we were putting the book together, and, and that's what it looked like. And then this was the, the finished version, but we did that together with you know no art directors or anybody. It was uh, just, just she and I. I want to pause for just a second before we talk about the band, um, and I want to talk about Donna for a moment. And just so people know this, because I'm not quite sure of how this all transpired. Now, you're a photographer in the days of your shooting, you know, 35 millimeters, you're done with the roll, you stick it back in those little containers. We use those containers for many other things back then, <laughs> but they were great to hold film as well. So you obviously had about 50, 100, I don't know how many of these, these rolls, these spools, that got lost. Or misplaced. Yeah. How were they found? They, well, it, were you snooping around? <laughs> hey, wait a minute. <laughs> Actually, who are these pictures of? Hmm? Well, because I wasn't there as a professional photographer, you know, I, I never even really saw most of the photographs because I never had time to print them. Um, so just put them back into the spools. So and, they, were, they weren't in spools, they were in sleeves, you know, they were black and white okay, negative oh, right, sleeves. Right. And there was about 2,000 pictures uh, all together. And uh, I had lost track of them 40 years ago, maybe. Hadn't even thought of them for 30 years and just figured they were gone forever and that was that. And then five years ago, Donna came in my office and she threw this envelope on the desk and said, you'll never guess what I just found. So then we started having them. Uh, <laughs> Yay, Donna! <laughs> yeah, Donna! Uh, so we had them digitized and scanned and started looking at them, and we realized that there was some stuff on there that was pretty interesting and may have had some historical significance because it was unseen photographs from 50 years ago. And uh, so we started doing some exhibits, and. Um, we did want, We had a pop-up right here in Westport early on, um, one of David Waldman's uh, spaces, and it was great. And then um, from, you know, then we ended up doing like a you know, California Heritage Museum, and then the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame got wind of it, and we did a year exhibit there. So it's been, it's been a really fun journey, and uh, and, that, and from that we started working on the book because people wanted to hear the stories that went with the pictures. So she made me write and then rewrite and then write. It, it really is, a, and, I'm, and I'm saying this, and I mean it sincerely, is it's really a book, when you gave it to me a couple of weeks ago, is, and I was telling Roger about this, is that you pick it up, you really can't put it down. Uh, not only for the photographs, uh, but for the stories as well, because it's an insight into, into uh, such an incredible industry that you were happened to be there at the right time, the right place, doing a big job. Uh, well, it was, the uh, timing was, was very exactly. fortunate. I, I was the luckiest kid that ever lived. I mean, I, it, it, you know, Donna calls me the Forrest Gump of uh, music <laughs> business, you know. I kind of stumbled into this career. Is that a compliment? It, it, I guess. <laughs> well, you can take it any I, way you want. No, but, uh, I, 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 I like it. I, I like to good. think of it as a compliment, yes. I mean, For, <laughs> Forrest did do very well uh, in the end. You're, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it, so much of it was serendipitous. And it, I was just, you know, I was born in 1943. That helped. And so it was, uh, it, it was just so fortunate that looking back on it was kind of more interesting to me because of the fact that I hadn't seen these friends and artists and pictures for 50 years. So it was like finding a time capsule. You know, it was, um, it was an incredible time and place in music, period. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time, and I was the right age. But um, 
you know, there was, there was no plan involved in any of this, uh, and there still isn't, actually. And to find myself here tonight doing this is just part of the <laughs> serendipity of it all, you know? I mean, we worked hard on the book, and we're very proud of it, but um, to, do the, to do the book launch in, uh, in Westport... Um, which is our hometown, and and uh, and to be here with everybody tonight, this is this is yeah. big stuff for me. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, Roger was just talking about the band, uh, one of my favorite bands. Um, I guess they got their name as being Bob Dylan's band. Now, did you meet the band after you you, you worked or met Bob Dylan? Was Actually, um, I met the, the band time? early on when I joined Albert, and okay. um, uh, he, they were already um, not his backup band. They had already done Big Pink, music from Big Pink, um, and I met them on a plane. Uh, I met them on a plane to Florida. Uh, they were going to be promoting uh, the release of music from Big Pink. Um, at a Capitol sales convention. It was like a hundred guys, a sales force for Capitol Records in a, in a hotel ballroom. And you can see, if you look at these pictures, it was, uh, you know, there wasn't really any stage or anything. They were just playing for these guys. And I think these are the first pictures ever taken of the band performing as the band instead of as Bob's backup. Um, I mean, Elliot Landy took a lot of pictures at Big Pink while they were recording, but, but they had never performed before. This was the first time, and so I was fortunate to were get Were the those. recordings out of Bearsville Records? Was that uh, established at that point? No. It was, okay. No, no, Bearsville came later. Came, did come later, all right. Yeah, yeah, they, they were on Capitol, and yeah. Um, they, were, they were great. Uh, they, they were really, in those days, a real band of brothers, and they had been together for years, played behind Bob, got booed off the stage everywhere they went in Europe for a year because of the going electric thing, you know? And it was very difficult for all of them. Um, Bob seemed to care less about it than everybody else, but Levon was, <laughs> was so distraught. He, he just split at one point. He couldn't take it anymore. Every time they get on stage, the audience start booing them. I don't even know why they came. They came to boo them. You know? and, uh, you had a very special relationship with, uh, with Levon Helm, uh, yeah. the late, great Levon Helm. Levon was, was just a fabulous guy, and he was one of my heroes as a drummer. And uh, <clears throat> when I lived in Woodstock, he used to come to my house and we'd, we'd play the drums and try to write songs with, with no other instruments. <laughs> try doing that sometime. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> when I think back on it, it's actually pretty silly, but, um, but it was a lot of fun. And then when I uh, decided to hang my drums up for good, um, I don't know if, I, if they, we have that picture, but... Uh, of the drum head. Yeah, of the drum. I asked Levon to sign my, my, uh, my old snare drum, and uh, so it's one of our treasured possessions now. But he was, he was the sweetest guy ever. Yeah, I loved him. And, and multi-talented. I mean, he was a great drummer, but he also was a string uh, yeah. aficionado on the mandolin especially. He well, was, he, you know, the guitar was his and first yeah, instrument. Was his first instrument, yeah, exactly. But he played yeah. mandolin, and, you know, he... He could pretty much do it all. He could play bass, too. Yeah, he was an all-around musician. And he just had a style that was unique. I've never seen anybody who, who, was, who stayed in the pocket like, like Levon did. I mean, he just had that certain, well, I'll get too technical, but he, he was just a, a drummer's drummer. Mm. I mean, that was really the instrument that he was he excelled beyond anybody on. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if they got the picture of the drum head, but it's kind of cool. Say, well, it's in the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> know, maybe there's don't show it. It's in the book. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Come That's just how I remember yeah. Levon. That's a, kind of the way that was his position playing, and uh, he, a, a, an incredible band. Uh, and you know, I guess the, the remaining two members, uh, Robbie uh, Robertson and Garth Hudson, uh, the last two remaining yeah. remaining yeah. members, and. Yeah, uh, you know, Robbie was more or less the leader, but I think I think uh, Levon was definitely the heart and soul. Absolutely, of that band. that's a good no description. I yeah. mean, you could just see when he sings and plays the drums at the same time. Which, yeah. as a drummer, I don't know if that's hard. I'm not a drummer, so but I, don't, <laughs> I yeah. think he said in the book, 
uh, that he found it easy to do to sing and play drums at the same time. Yeah, I find it very unintuitive. I mean, yeah. to me, it's, it's you know, <laughs> that thing. It's, it's just, it's not natural, but for him it was. And uh, nobody could do it better than he. he. He did it effortlessly and better than anybody. Yeah. So the band was, was, a, was a, a, a real treat to work with. I worked with them for a few years. Yeah. Where are we going? I don't know, I'm looking, for, I'm looking at the next picture coming up. Well, that's good old Levon. Hello? Who's, who's the... Getting a call here, Raj. Yeah, you can answer <laughs> it if you want, go on. <laughs> uh, can we get the slides moving? Uh, there we go. Do the Rolling Stones. Uh, there you go, that's from 1969, Madison Square Garden. And if you get to another couple of shots of it is what I was mentioning before, you know, back in the, well, there you go. I mean, look, look, look at that state. That looks like Staples High School. I mean, the same state, look at that. The same know, it was amazing. Yeah. It was just amazing. It really was, and I guess it could have been one of the first shows, or one of the first with Mick Taylor, who took over from uh, Brian Jones when he, right. when he left the band, I, and I think before he died. Yeah, he uh, never liked being in, in the Rolling Stones. He quit no. after about a year, I think, or two. Oh, Mick, Mick Taylor did, yeah. And yeah. Keith Richards' day says he, does, he doesn't know why. He's a, yeah. like, they really liked him, he was good. Well, he was, he was probably the best guitar player that ever think, played with them. Yeah. And then something that completely off subject, because, you know, Know, working on radio, I, I have a, a plethora of useless trivia knowledge, but one guitar player that they wanted to play for the Stones, and he turned them down, was probably the best guitar player of all, and it's Roy Buchanan. Yeah, yeah. well, you know that? that's, I didn't know that, and Roy Buchanan's a country player. Maybe I, could, maybe I should sit in the middle chair. Well, do it on volume two, okay. we'll credit you. We'll do that next week, I'll be in the middle chair. No, but real, Roy, an incredible blues guitar player that passed away uh, quite tragically, but yeah, turned down the stones. Yeah. Go figure. Hey, you know, we all make mistakes. <laughs> when, Keith was, when Keith was cute, up there, up to the right, though he's great now, don't get me wrong, I love him. He's still cute. He's very cute. Yeah. But there it is, what a great shot that is, look at that. Yeah, that was a, uh, talk about lucky, you know, I mean, there I was <laughs> as basically there with Janice, so I had this all-access pass, which allowed me to go anywhere, um, and it, uh, I, was, I was actually on stage taking these photographs, probably 10 feet away from Jagger and all these guys, um, and the, the sound, the, the, the intensity of that concert was like nothing I had ever experienced. I mean, it, I, even, even, yeah, look at that. That's, that's what 20,000 people look like. Um, and, uh, and you can see how close I was in the other pictures. Um, so it was really something. It was probably the greatest rock and roll concert of all time. Uh, in fact, I think Craig Clay, Clayburn, Clayburn from the New York Times, he, uh, I think he said it was the, the greatest uh, rock and roll concert in history. And uh, I was very, very lucky to be there. Well, that's the thing what I like about this book, is that you were in a position, you know, in your, in, as, uh, in, in your business, your job, it was sort of a lot of hats. I mean, photography, obviously, a passion, you know, music as well, but being in the industry and being in a situation where you had access like this, and the fact that you knew enough to, like I would, I mean, I've been on backstage at many, many places and I've never bought a camera with me, which I did. Uh, you did, you bought the camera with me and you took a lot of these incredible photographs. Well, I had uh, Bruce to thank for that, really, because otherwise they just would have been snapshots that anybody could, you know, pose for me and smile, you know, yeah. snap the picture. But for me, I wanted to capture the moment, I wanted to capture the experience the, the connection between the, the photograph and the music was important to me. I love seeing the image come up in the dark room, in the bath, you know, and, and then you record the music and you have the two things together and it was, you know, it, it really completed uh, the picture for me. It was, otherwise I wouldn't have done it. And I stopped taking pictures after this period in my life. Um, even when I went to work at Clive Davis years later, I never took a picture. Um, but and, and that was what, what year, what, timeline wise? That was, that was in 1979. Because uh, the, the book is pretty much 1963 to 1975-ish. 
Yeah, well, uh, the photographs are mostly 68 yeah. to 73. I worked with Christofferson um, and Rita after I was with Albert, and that he, Albert didn't manage them. Bert Block did, and I was living in Woodstock, and um, I knew Bert because he had been a partner of Albert's in New York. And uh, Woodstock was starting to become kind of, you know, overrun and had changed. To, it wasn't the same as it was when I had moved there, where everybody was, you know, young and innocent and jamming with each other and playing around. It got to be kind of a Lord of the Flies situation, you know, too many kids, not enough adults. And, um, and so Bert uh, got a hold of me and asked me if I would be interested in coming to Connecticut. I, I, he was in Ridgefield and managing Chris and Rita. And I jumped at it because I, my whole family was from here and I was ready to move back to Connecticut. And so I did that for a couple of years. And it was, Chris was the, he, he was the, my favorite person that I ever worked with. He had the most impact on me personally and was the most interesting guy I think I ever met. I, just, I mean, uh, of course, he has, people know he, you know, wrote the song, Me and Bobby McGee, and to me, it's that line, uh, I'll uh, trade uh, all my tomorrows for a single yesterday. To me, it's one of the most beautiful lines uh, in that song. I mean, talk about love. It's just absolutely incredible. Well, he was an amazing person. I mean, yeah. he was really amazing. He, w he had done everything right his whole life, right up until he got his master's degree from Oxford in English literature, turned around and got disowned by his parents because he, he uh, quit the army. He, had, he was a helicopter pilot and a Rhodes Scholar and a Golden Gloves boxer and a, you know on and on and on. And he just threw it all away because he wanted to be a songwriter. And he, uh, he moved to Nashville and became a songwriter and tried... He, he was destitute. He was living in a, a rundown tenement for $25 a month. And uh, he wanted to get his songs to Johnny Cash so badly that he took a helicopter and landed it on Cash's front lawn. And uh, <laughs> that didn't work. Uh, <laughs> however, Cash ended up doing uh, Help Me Make It Through the Night, I think, which was uh, probably maybe his biggest hit. But he was just, he was brilliant. I mean, if you listen to his lyrics and, and um, uh, his just, I, I don't know, there was something about the way he wrote songs and, and there was something about his persona. I, I often say that when you walked into a room with Chris, the energy in the whole room would change and that even people that didn't know who he was, he just was, he was just the most charismatic person and the most laid back Un, unassuming guy you'd ever want to meet. And uh, he, he was brilliant. And the thing that I took away from my relationship with him, and I think I mentioned it in the epilogue of the book, is that he talks about it in his songs, but his, his mantra really was freedom and uh, not having to do what other people expected of you. And pre pretty much that's how I've lived my life. And uh, and as I say in the book, you know, that comes at a price. Um, but once you have it, it's priceless. Because, uh, you know, if you listen to his songs, he talks about freedom a lot. He talks about relationships and, and, and that sort of thing as well. But that seems to be a thread that runs through all of his music. And I, I respected him so much for having the courage to just leave everything he had accomplished and turn his back on it and just do what he wanted to do. He ended up being a, a great uh, songwriter and, and uh, actor. Um, he had a fantastic career. So, yeah, he was, he was the best. You know, the, the, the book, um, and look at the, and it's, and it's such a great book, it's, it really sort of, uh, to me, identifies me as looking at the fabric of my life in, in, in the form of music. I'm looking at all these memories from, you know, the late 60s, early 60s, right up until now, and uh, this book uh, just really brings all that home to me. Uh, it's an awesome book too, so definitely check it out over here. I don't. Uh, you never paid us for that book. I don't think Donna. Did, I, you, did I, Mike ever? Give, I think. My, I think my daughter Sarah's here. God, he really Sarah. likes it. You know. Sarah, Sarah, do you have my wallet? Oh, you left it home. Okay. Uh, you bring your credit card, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> of course I did. Um, you know, to all this talk, and I want Roger to talk about this, because uh, we're going to wrap this little thing up. We've got, I mean, we've got some great music coming up in a, in well, a few you've minutes. Got, so definitely hang around. Yeah, I mean, the, the yeah. band, we were sitting there for sound check. Unbelievable. Uh, playing a lot of the music that's from the artists that are in this book. These, so guys, these guys are all super pros. I mean, they, they played with, with a lot of the artists that I've been talking about tonight. Um, and all of them are top pros, and Roger's put together a, a great band, as he always does. And, uh, you know, it's worth sticking around for. It'd be fun. You can even take some of those chairs and put them in the back and dance. <laughs> Remember dancing? Yes. <laughs> there were wild times in the 60s. Michael has a, a very interesting story about one of the craziest nights of his career that I would like him to share because if we miss it, uh, it, it, would, it would be incomplete tonight unless you realize, you know, the depths of yeah. what This is on. the uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll story <laughs> for everybody who came expecting to hear sex, drugs, and rock and roll stories. But um, uh, so... Janice had three bands. It was Big Brother and the Holding Company, the Cosmic Blues Band, and then her final band was the Full Tilt Boogie Band. Um, she hadn't been able to really get comfortable with the band behind her, so we, with the band that she had been uh, working with at the time in both those instances. So we set out to put together a, a third band for her called the Full Tilt Boogie Band. Um, my main com contribution to that was uh, it was Richard, uh, oh God, what's his name? Yes. Bell, Richard Bell. He was a keyboard player. I saw him <laughs> at the Fillmore <laughs> playing with Ronnie Hawkins' uh, band, and uh, he almost beat me up because he caught me st stealing uh, Richard Bell. <laughs> he had already been ripped off <laughs> by Dylan for the whole, guy. all the all the members of the band were previously with Ronnie Hawkins' group, and, and uh, Dylan stole the whole band. And then years later, I came to the Fillmore and I, <laughs> and I was, I was taking, I was talking to Bell and asking him if he might be interested in playing with Janice. And I feel this this guy grabbed my shoulder and he throws me up against the wall and he puts his hand around my neck. He says, you tell Albert Grossman I'm sick and tired of being his fucking farm team. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, I'll be sure to tell him that and uh, I got to go. And as I left, I slipped my card to uh, Richard Bell and he became, uh, he became Janice's uh, keyboard player. But um, anyway, we put this band together and... Uh, it was it was a great band, and um, they we put them out in uh, in Larkspur, uh, Gary. You know where that is, right? Um, in California, that's where Janice had a house, and they were rehearsing out there for for about a month or so. And um, so I flew out to see how how they were doing, and uh, and I listened to them, and and they were you know they were in good shape. Um, I felt they were ready to showcase. So I said to Janice, you, you know, what do you want to do? You want to find a little place somewhere here where nobody knows, you know, what we're doing? And we'll, we'll put them on stage, see, see how it sounds. So she says, oh, man, she says, that's a great idea. She says, let's, the Hells Angels, I have a lot of friends in the Hells Angels. And, uh, you know, they could use some money in their chapter. They don't ever have enough money. And those guys buy me groceries and everything else. So why don't we do a free concert for them, a party? And I, and, uh, I, said, I said, Janice, I, I, that sounds like a really terrible idea. <laughs> uh, do you want to play a, a Hell's Angels party? I, this is the original Hell's Angels in San Francisco. These guys are murderers and drug fiends and crazies. And... Uh, so she said, yeah, she did. Anyway, we, I said, okay. So we booked this place and, um, and uh, attached to a motel somewhere. It was like a big uh, room. And uh, when I got there, the, uh, the Hells Angels had about, a, I don't know, maybe 500 motorcycles circling this building and two guys with shotguns protecting them 
Um, so I knew immediately that <laughs> we were in for, a, for an interesting evening. So we went in, and uh, all the guys were there, only Hell's Angels and their girlfriends. They were all in their colors, full regalia, you know, and um, they were all stoned out of their minds. They had little baggies that looked like Skittles that were actually drugs. And, um, and so the, uh, she, oh, Janice wanted to have her original band, Big Brother and the Holding Company, open for, for her band. So the Big Brother goes on, and they start to play. And, uh, and this crowd was like, it, it was nasty. Uh, I, that's all I can tell you is that it was a really rough crowd. Um, so Nick Gravenitis is singing lead uh, in the Big Brother band now. Nick is a real well-known, great blues singer, uh, musician. And they start singing a song and playing. And Nick is singing, he's got his eyes closed, you know. And uh, all of a sudden, this young, beautiful girl jumps up on the stage and takes all her clothes off. And Nick is singing, he doesn't see it, you know? And so the crowd's going, yeah, yeah, you know, the guys are going, they're loving it, right? And so I can see Nick is thinking, oh, this is going well. <laughs> and, and, uh, so, <laughs> so then this young dude jumps up on the stage, takes all his clothes off. <laughs> now the crowd's really getting excited, right? <laughs> And Nick's still singing with his eyes closed. <laughs> the crowd's going crazy. And Nick's thinking, this is it, man. <laughs> this is how it all starts, you know? This is, we got something going here. These are the Hell's Angels, and they love us. Um, I mean, I'm imagining, I'm imputing that. But anyway, the next thing you know, these two people, these naked people, are on the stage floor uh, having intercourse. <laughs> And uh, Nick is still singing with his eyes closed. <laughs> they, the crowd's going berserk. The song ends. Nick opens his eyes. He looks down. He jumps back <laughs> like, like he had just seen a snake or something. You know? and, and I always say, I wish I'd had my camera at that moment <laughs> to take a picture of his face. Yeah. So that was, oh, and Janice got in a fist fight that night with another girl. Um, she tried to get, take a drink. The, this girl had a bottle, and she said, give me a, give me a drink of that. Way I'm going on in five minutes. I need a drink. So she reached for the, the, the bottle. The girl slugged her in the face, and then Janice slugged her in the face. And next thing you know, we're trying to drag the girl off of Janice and Janice off the girl and two guys pull out knives and they start circling each other. It was quite a night. You should have been there. <laughs> well, it's Roger, the craziest and, night of my life. And, I think. And Roger, great to hook up with you again. Uh, Michael, great to, great to finally meet you and, and you hang too, out with Mike. you. Had a lot of fun. This book is absolutely incredible. Uh, as I you. said, you can't put it down. You really can't. And uh, if you look around, there's a lot of photographs that you took that are, are blown up around here. And I believe you're going to be signing some books too. I so am, yeah. yeah. So now it's time to get and I it. Both, but, and yeah. you'll write a nice little, ins you know, inscription to everyone, like you did for me. Yeah. That I didn't pay for. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just want to, before we close, I just want to say a couple of words that, um, you know. This, doing this book was, was an amazing uh, undertaking, as has been the whole process since we found these negatives, since Donna found them. But I, I have to tell you that every step of the way, every aspect of the book that has turned out to be exactly the way we wanted it, and that's why we self-published. And we just took... Um, more than two years doing it and making sure that the quality was what we wanted, making sure that the, that the you know, that it was honest and that it was the, you know, the pictures that we felt were right. And, and Donna, from the very first day, was really the person that did 
eighty percent of of the, all of the work. We had we had a graphic designer who was wonderful guy, Hank Manassen, and he he was terrific. But as far as curating and editing and and weaving together the pictures with the stories and laying out the different uh, chapters and uh, you know making sure that my writing ended up making sense and didn't seem like a sixth grader scribbling. Um, I mean, it was all to my co-author, Donna Vita, who has just been magnificent every step of the way in this thing and really deserves most of the credit for what the book has turned out to, unless you don't like it, and then it's, you know, it's mostly me. She's turning red. <laughs> Would you like to talk a little bit about Woodstock before we close? Uh... This portion, or we're oh, we're, we're, we're getting the sign right here. Ruth. We got get the sign. Musicians back there. That are, All right. That, that they let want me, to come out here and jam. Let me say thank you very much to uh, Mike Lapatino for thank being you, with thank us. Thank you. Oh, my, my honor to be here. Thank you so much. And what you a know. pleasure. And let me also say thank you to Montage Modern for donating these wonderful Mies van der Rohe chairs and tables, yep, thank you. so we could look groovy up here. And Michael Friedman, as you now have learned, is quite an incredible person with quite an incredible book and pictures. And we invite you to survey and mingle and take a book home or order one. And thank you so much. Don't miss the band that's coming on. I personally, it's my favorite band. I think you'll like them. We have some and very thank unusual. Thank you to Roger very much. He put this whole thing together. Great job. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for the...